So, we are starting today our shir, where we're going to focus on one figure. We're going to talk about the Rambam. Today, as some of you might know, this is the Rambam's year site. And so, the Rambam passed away on the 20th of Peves, which is, that's today's date. <clears throat> and we're going to try to talk a little bit about why the Rambam is so important to us, to the Torah world, to the Jewish people, what was his contribution to the world. And there's always a question where to start. Um, I think the best place to start is just a little bit about his life, because I don't know how many of you know um, the life of the Rambam, or as he's known in English, Maimonides. Um, so we'll start with his birth. So the Rambam was born in the city of Cordoba in Spain. Uh, that's in the south. And he was born... Now this is the question. We have three dates. When I was in, in school, um, it was th 1135. And then they said, no, the evidence is that he was born on 1137. And there was a whole two schools of thought of 35ers and 37ers. And now, if you look at the material, they say that he was born in 1138. So, exactly when he was born, we're not sure. Between 1135 and 1138, um, there, it's very hard to figure out exactly what date. So, he grew up in the city. He learned Torah uh, from his father. His father was Rav Maimon. His father was a student of the Rimi Gash, Rabbeinu Yosef Migash, who um, was the top student of the Rif. The Rif was Rabbi Tzchak Al-Fasi that came to Spain and opened the yeshiva in a city called Lucena and uh, lived a very, very long life. He left us um, his halachot, Ilchot Arif, on the Gemara. And Rabbeinu Yosef Migash, Rabbi Migash, Migash, was the next Rosh Hashiva after the Rif. And the Rambam's father learned with the Rimi Gash. In 1148, southern Spain was conquered by a group of people that came over from Morocco. They were called Al Muwahidun. Al Muwahidun are people who believe in the one God, the people who are Me'achdim, Muwahidun. They are the ones that make believe in the one God. And when they conquered, Southern Spain, they gave the Jews two options. Actually, th always they give three options, right? But nobody wants the third option. One option was convert to Islam. The second option was to migrate, to leave. And the third option was dying. dying. That's it. It's very simple. So although they're very generous in giving three options, really nobody wants the third option. Everybody wants to do the two options. So the family from 1148 onwards are trying to survive in this very hostile environment, very difficult uh, situation for all Jews living in southern Spain under the Mualhidun regime. But at some point, which is 1159, the family decides we can't take it any longer. And the move, they move across the Gibraltar Straits to Morocco, which is very, very odd, because you would think the Muahidun center of power was in Morocco. So you would think that if you're going to go anywhere, the last place to go is where the rulers were. But the Maimonides family, the Rambam's family, could come there incognito. Nobody would notice them. They would just simply blend into the background. And so the family moved to Fez, and the Rambam started learning with a big Rav, Rabbeinu Rabbi Yehuda Ibn Shushan, and studied with him until his <coughs> rabbi was murdered, he died for Kiddush Hashem, and that happened in 1165. And that was a sign for the family that they were going to have to leave Morocco. So they left Fez, and they went to Eretz Yisrael. And the Rambam writes that they went to Akko, up north, they were in Yerushalayim, they visited Hebron, 
And for a few months, they're traveling around Eretz Yisrael, trying to figure out what to do. And they, due to the financial difficulties they had in Eretz Yisrael, they decided to settle in a, a, a country, an area just south of Israel, which is today in Egypt. And so the family came to Egypt, and the family stayed. The Rambam lived for the rest of his life um, in Egypt until his death in 1204. So he is in Egypt from about 1166, plus or minus, until 1204. It's a significant uh, chunk of time living in Egypt. The Rambam began writing when he was young. Uh, his first uh, work is called Kitab Makala Fi Sanat Al Mantiq, which is a work on uh, Mantiq is logic. It's an introductory work to teach people how to think. It's based on um, Aristotelian uh, writings and also um, one of the more famous. Muslim philosophers. His name was Al-Farabi. Al-Farabi uh, was a 10th century thinker. And the Rambam wrote this work to sort of help people learn the formal logic, or at least the Aristotelian logic, that he believed people should know. And he wrote that between the age of 16 and 18. Um, it's, it's very, very interesting work. For those of you who are interested in logic, um, so, not very difficult. Uh, it's something that you could um, work on. If you need any help, I'm happy to help you. It's not like the work in logic of the Ramchal. It has a different um, category, different ideas of how to understand logic. Um, but the Rambam is the first. So that was his first book. Um, he then wrote a, um, a treatise on the calendar, on the Jewish calendar. Ma'amar uh, Ibu. that's also, if I'm not mistaken, he wrote in Arabic. And then, in the age of 23, he started writing one of the more famous books, Kitab Siraj. Right? You know this book as Perusha Mishnayis. So the Rambam wrote a perush on, a commentary on Mishnayot in Arabic, based on, that's why he chose an Arabic name. And in the introduction, it's a, I, I think that if you, there's one book that anybody who's interested in learning about Judaism should read, is the introduction to the commentary on the Mishnah by the, by the Rambam. He's giving, he will give you the history of Judaism, the history of the Oral Torah, how it works. It's a very, very important work that I don't think anybody um, should skip and avoid. It's one of the basic, basic books that one should read. And it's not very long. He worked on Perusha Mishnayis for 10 years. So he finished, he started when he was 23. He finished the Perush when he was 33. And we know that he revised his commentary as he uh, continued learning. Then at the age of 33, the Rambam starts writing what people think is the most important book written, um, at least in the period, which is called Mishneh Torah. The Mishneh Torah is a monumental uh, work. Uh, we're going to talk about why it's so important um, a little bit later. He worked on the Mishneh Torah for 10 years. And that number of years, that amount is very important. Because there are about, I think, a thousand chapters in Mishnah Torah. Okay? And if you take 10 years, that's 3,652 days. Correct? Now, if you subtract Shabbosim, right? There's 52 Shabbosim a year, right? At least. And Yamim Toivim, which is, he's not in Eretz Yisrael, which means there are two days of every. Oh, then you subtract that. You're talking about that the Rambam produced one chapter every three days. One chapter in every three days. And in one parak of Mishnah Torah, 
you could have sugyas, topics, from all over Shas. It could be Mishnayas, it could be Midrashim, it could be the Bavli, it could be Yerushalmi, it could be in Gitin, it could be in Shviz, it could be everywhere. So right now in the Yeshiva we're all learning about Prusbo. And we know that the sugya we're looking in Gitin, but there is material in Masechet Shviz of the Mishnayas, but there's also Shviz in um, uh, the Yerushalmi. There's also pieces in Moed Katon that we saw today, which means that the, when the Rambam is writing one parak, he has to factor all of the sugyas that have to deal with that chapter. Same thing when his, whatever it is, you take Shabbos, Hilchot Yisodei Torah, whatever topic you take, every, it means that every parak was written in approximately three days. That's an incredible feat. Um, I don't think there's anybody who, even with a modern computer system with Jad GPT, I don't think you could figure that out on your own. So that's what the Rambam did for 10 years. And he included, as I said, all of the material from Torah Shabbat Peh, from the Oral Torah. Everything was factored. And not only that he factored what was sort of Chazal, or the Amorayim, but also the Gaonim. That is, the rabbis of the Babylonian yeshivot, uh, and the, during, even during the late Persian and early Muslim period, the writings of the Goenim were also factored by the Rambam. So that he took a complete account of everything that there was up to his period, and factored it in such a way that produced us this monumental work called Mishnah Torah, which we're going to speak about a little bit later. In 1176, the Rambam started writing his, as far as I'm concerned, uh, or what I was concerned, that was his most famous work, Mori Nevuchim, Dalalat al-Ha'irin, the Guide of the Perplexed. He worked on the Guide of the Perplexed for approximately 15 years. It did not come out in book form. It would come out as sort of, you know how in comic books you have a series, but every so often you get another version, another parak, another chapter, and they would be sent one by one, and you'd have to sort of collect them and then put them in a book form. And so over 15 years, he is writing different sections of the Mor Nevuchim. When did he finish it? So the evidence that we have today is that by 1190, the entire Mor Nebuchim was complete. And in 1193 or 4, there's a letter that the Rambam sent to Provence. Provence are, the, they were Jewish communities on the other side of the, of the border from Spain to France. So it's in, in the south. And Provence, there were Jewish communities there that were very much appreciating what the Rambam was working on. And he sent them um, a, a, one of the, his epistles are writing about astrology, about astronomy and astrology, if you're interested. And there they asked him, they sent back an answer and asked him if he could send them a copy of the Mor Nevuchim, of the, his book, and either translate it which means that they could get it in Hebrew. Or if not, let them send the copy in the Arabic and they will have it translated in Provence. Um, and the Rambam obliged them. He sent them a copy in Arabic. And then at that point, Rabbi Shmuel ibn Tibon, who comes from a long line of translators, began translating the Mor Nevuchim as what we have it, which means that the book that he began working on the translation already while the Rambam was alive. And he actually sent his translation, some pieces of translation, to the Rambam for him to look at. And he asked if he can come visit the Rambam uh, so he can go over significant sections because he wasn't sure how to translate. And the Rambam said, listen, I've read what you've done. You did great. Keep going. You don't need to come. And that's the famous letter where he tells us of his daily schedule, which we're going to get into a little bit later. And so that is 
in 1193. The Mar uh, just because it's very important work for me, uh, has 161 chapters. Why is that important? Because the Mar Nebuchim, everybody claims, is a work of philosophy. So you should know out of 161 chapters, it only has 17 chapters that deal with philosophy. Only 17. The rest of the chapters, the majority, the vast majority of the Sefer is dealing with how to interpret psukim, how to understand verses in the Torah, how to understand major concepts in Judaism, the relationship of God to the world, how did creation work, Mashgach uh, of divine providence, uh, the problem of evil, all the major theological issues, they're all found in this book. The Rosh Hashiva of uh, Hebron, the late uh, Rav Chetzka Sarna, said it's agreed upon by almost everybody that the Rambam wrote his book, Mor Nebuchim, to help those who are perplexed with regard to Darke Yamuna. But he says even though that's agreed upon, it's something that is a complete lie. That's what he said. Although everybody believes that the Rambam wrote this book only for people who are perplexed, and they think that that's the real purpose of the book, but he says it's a lie. The Rambam wrote a book for every one of us to teach us about the major principles in Judaism. He did it in a certain way. He has a certain mahalich, a certain methodology, it is very, very um, um, detailed. You have to learn one chapter after the other. He says you have to connect one chapter to the next, and so on. You have to read it very carefully. You have to look up everything that he says. You have to do what you do in every when you read a Rishon. Um, I teach a course. I, I teach a shir on Mor Nevuchim twice a week, and uh, in in one of my shiurim, uh, this Shiva Bachar in Avrech says. You know, I was told that I shouldn't study more in Avuchim because it's, it's going to confuse me, it's going to cause doubt. I said to him, listen, the Rambam is a Rishon. The Rambam is one of the premier rabbis who continue the Masorah of Judaism from one generation to the next. There is no way the Rambam would write something that would be an obstacle to your connection to the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Um, that's my position. Let's um, get a little bit of a wider view. The Rivash, Rabbeinu Rabbi Yitzchak Bar Sheshes, he is a 14th century Spanish rabbi. Um, he's also a figure we should probably do a class on. Um, he lived um, through one of the most tragic events that occurred to the Jewish people in Spain, a hundred years before the expulsion from Spain. Uh, in 1391, a pogrom, and attack, began in southern Spain and spread very quickly throughout the country, where a third of the Jews were murdered, a third of the Jews converted to Christianity, and a third survived. Okay? The Rivash, if you look at his Chuvot, you will find that he is dealing with all the aftermath of families and people. There's different people that are trying to find each other, this one was killed, this one converted, this one was forcibly converted. All of this sort of balagan he's dealing with. But he wrote about the Rambam. And this is in the Shut Arivash, Simen Memhei. He says, The Rambam, Zichonol Ivracha, learned kodem lachen kol Torah kula. The Rambam learned the entire complete Torah. Bishlemus. He learned everything. Halachot. Agadot, Tosefta, Sifra, Sifri, the entire Talmud Bavli and the Yerushalmi. And you could see it just by looking at the Mishnah Torah. So that you're talking about a person that encompassed everything that there was to know about Judaism. And the Rambam, and I think that this is why it's so important to us. The Rambam does something that I don't think anybody before him did. When you learn the Rambam, you learn that your limud 
your Torah learning needs to be all-encompassing. That we don't separate between things that are connected. For example, we don't separate between the written Torah and the oral Torah. We don't separate them. We don't separate between things that are relevant for our generation, like Lulav and Esrog, or things that are not relevant, which is the base of Mikdash. The Rambam is not holding like the tour of the Beis Yosef, right, and the Shulchan Aruch, that we're going to write the halachot that are relevant for today. The Rambam says that is not a distinction that we should do. And so the Mishnah Torah encompasses the halachot of every topic, whether it's relevant or, ir- or not so relevant anymore. He writes also things that are connected between halacha and what we would call philosophy. That is, for the Rambam, there's no distinction to make that when you're learning halacha, it's halacha, it's independent from what we would call in yeshivish language, hashkafa. That is, how do we look at what's happening? So the Rambam says, we don't separate these things. When you learn halacha, you have to understand what is the perspective. What is the big idea that the Torah is trying to give us? Right? If the Torah is a reflection of the will of Hashem, what is Hashem trying to tell us? What is going on in every mitzvah? And the Rambam tells us that we need to find ta'amea mitzvot. We should try to find what is the ta'am. Why did Hashem give us this mitzvah? There's got to be a reason for it. It's not just stam that the Kaddish Baruch Hu decided, you know, let's just do shatnes. Right? You can't wear wool and linen. Why? There is a reason for it. If you learn the Mishnah Torah, the Rambam will tell you. Also, there's ta'amea mitzvot in the Mora Nevuchim. So the Rambam took that very seriously, that it's not only knowing what the halachot are, but also to have the proper perspective of what it's the meaning. And we don't separate these categories. When we learn the Rambam, we discover his innovation. He's very, very innovative. And he's very deep. And you could see that he is, has no problem, no qualms about being first. That is, nobody, nobody before him ever dreamt of writing a safer in halacha to include every halacha. Nobody did that. Not even the riff. And the Rambam looked up to the riff. He says, I am like the riff everywhere, except in a few places. I'm like the riff. That is, to him, the riff was, you know, the best of the best. But did you find in the Rambam that since Chazal, there wasn't anybody that took on the entire Torah and put it together for us? Uh, it's interesting that if you, Rav Yitzchak uh, Tversky Zatzal, um, who was at Harvard, wrote an article, this is a long time ago, um, look, evaluating at the different descriptions of the Rambam by Rishonim. And he noticed that one of the repeating descriptions, that there was nobody like him since Rav Ashi and Ravina. That People said, the many, many Rishonims, he brings a whole list. There were other things that people said about him that some people had qualms or didn't, they didn't thought that was a little too much. But to say that nobody since Ravashi and Ravina, who had a complete picture, they gave us, right, the Bavli was for Ravashi and Ravina. With, after them, there wasn't anybody until you hit the 12th century with the Rambam. The teachings of the Rambam are based upon a clear understanding of the, all the details of Allah and the principles of the Muna, right? the basic principles of what does it mean to be a Jew in terms of belief. And to say that both of them, both of these topics, are connected in a natural a necessary way, and we have to keep them together. That is not to separate the Ikare Muna 
the major principles of faith and the halachot. Because one fits with the other. That's how Hashem gave it to us. And that's a very, very important piece of understanding uh, the Rambam. The Rambam was very much aware, and I'm going to give you some examples, uh, that there are going to be people who would oppose his methodology. He was aware that it was, that it was coming. He saw it. He lived through it. Uh, it not only occurred while he was alive, but there were several what we would call Maimonidian controversies post, more after he died. Um, once uh, it was during his son's life, Rabbeinu Avraham uh, ben Arambam, that tried to protect his father's reputation. But even after that, it continued till the 14th century, in the 1400s. It, it became so bad that the Sforim of the Rambam, the Morin of Uchim, was burnt by um, the church in France. And Rabbi Yoyna says uh, that he thought that they went too far and as a punishment there was the burning of the Talmud in Paris because of what happened that it led to the burning of the books of the Rambam. So at Kedikar, the Rabbi Yoyna felt that everybody went too far. Uh, the Ramban tried to quell the Maimonidian controversy, try to sort of make peace between all the, the, the sides. Um, whether he was successful or not is not so clear. Uh, but by the time we get the edict, there's a, the Rajba has a cherem against anybody who studies philosophy. Very, very important cherem, so that you were not allowed to study philosophy if you're under the age of 30, unless you were studying medicine. That you were okay, but if you wanted to study philosophy, then you couldn't. But the books of, of the Rambam were not included in that cherem. So whatever that was, by that period, by the Rashba's period, the Morin of Uchim was already in. It wasn't considered to be a problematic book, Bo Hashem. So the Rambam knew that there was going to be a problem. He knew that people would disagree with him, and that they would attack his principles of Amuna that are included in his system, but we see that the Rambam did not shy away. He did not stop what he's doing. He continued, and so that even though 30 years later, after his death, his books were burned, he, I don't know that he, can't tell if he really knew how bad the things would get, but he was prepared to deal with um, uh, such circumstances. The Morin of Uchim in the introduction says that he wrote it for one student. Okay? And his one student is Rabbi Yosef ben Yehuda ibn Aknin, um, who studied with the Rambam in, in Egypt. And then he traveled, he went to Baghdad, and from Baghdad he settled somewhere in Halib in Syria. And there was an exchange of letters, and there's one letter that he wrote to um, his student. And I'm going to share some excerpts from this letter because it tells us about who the Rambam is. Um, not this, I'm, we all know what a Godoli is, or at least we should. And we should invest more and more time learning um, the teachings of the Rambam because then we will get a, a, a complete picture of what the Torah is. But I want you to hear the Rambam as a person. And this letter... I, I should tell you, I read this letter every sort of every few weeks or so. So I pick it up, I read it, and um, I, I forgot. I wanted to bring the original, but I forgot this morning when I left the house because the original is in Arabic. Rav Kapach published the Arabic uh, with his own translation, so I didn't bring that. But there's online you could find uh, the Hebrew a Hebrew translation, a medieval Hebrew translation of this letter and where you hear about who the Rambam was as a person, as a teacher. And the letter is in response to something that happened. Um, it's a little fuzzy historically of what happened, but their Babylonian Jewish community, the community in, in, in today is in Baghdad, was there were three major positions in that community. There was the head of the community, there was the Rosh Shiva. 
and then the, the next, the person who would teach in the, in the yeshiva. So those are three spots. Two of them were occupied. The head of the community seemed to have been open. And the Rambam and his student were trying to install somebody into that position, whereas the other two positions did not want that person, and so it turned out kind of ugly. And there were letters and things were said that the student of the Rambam was sort of fighting. They attacked the Rambam and he fought back. He tried to defend his teacher, uh, the Rambam, in the eyes of the community. And then, so the Rambam got complaint letters that this young upstart is not being respectful to the elders. Because you have the Rosh Shiva, he's an old man. He's a... So the Rambam is writing to his student to sort of, hey, you know, tranquilo as we say in Spanish, right? Take it easy. Tone it down a little bit. So he says like this. He says, about the Mishnah Torah, you should know that I did not write this chibur to become famous among the Jews. That's not my purpose. Or that I will have fame. He says, but God knows, Hashem Yisbarach knows that I only toiled it la'atzmi. I did it for myself. I wrote the Mishnah for myself so that I don't have to always go looking up what the halacha is. And that when I get to old age and I won't remember what the halacha, I have a quick reference. He says, that's the first reason I wrote the Mishnah Torah. For himself. He says, I wrote it for me, to help me. Okay, fine. Then he says, I, saw, I also had kano kiniti l'ashem. I was zealous to Hashem. Because I noticed that we are a people without a law book. That without true iyun, right, in-depth learning, we would not know what to do. Everything is with the machloikis, there's arguments, right? If you look at the Gemara, right? If you, let's say you were a rabbi back then, and somebody came to you with a chicken and said, is this kosher? Well, you have to go open chulin and start looking up and this and this and that. The Rambam wanted that we should have, as a nation, we should have one law book that we could just open and read whatever the Allah you need, and this is what it is, these are the principles, and move on. And that's what I did. I see it. He says, Asiti lichvod Hashem is Barach. I did it in honor of Hashem. I did it for Hashem. Okay. And he says also, I knew that when I write it, there are going to be people who are going to be upset with me. He says, I knew that there were people who would be bad, evil, or jealous that would have naughty things to say about this book. They would say very nasty things about it. And they wouldn't understand what this says. And they couldn't figure it out. He says, I understand that. I took that into account. But he said, but if only one person can have a toilet, can have benefit from what I wrote, that's good enough. One person, the Raman said, if one other person, even he says his student, you, if only one person could have benefit from this book, that's good enough for me. The fact that everybody else will have complaints and will say bad things about the book doesn't bother me. And then he says, but I know that the Chachmei Tzalfat, the rabbis of France, saw this book and they have good things to say. They've asked me questions and I clarified. He understood that. He says, that's good. That's good, but I know that people are going to be jealous and there are going to be people who are going to be against this. And now he says that, the, that what I wrote and people's reaction, he says that if somebody would always get angry and upset when somebody doesn't accept, can't understand what he wrote, he says, I would go every day with a frown, I will be upset all the time. He says, that's not who I am. That's not who I am. He says, I don't want to live a life of pain and anger just because people don't understand what I wrote. They don't understand it. They don't understand it. Awesome. But I'm not going to get angry about it. And he says, 
to a student, you should follow my midot. Whenever you are confronted by people who are attacking me as your Rebbe, and you want to defend them, he says, you should know how I behave. The Rambam says, you think that when I go to shul, people don't come up to me and start asking, why did you write this? Why did you say that? Why did you do this? What? And the Rambam says, you know, sometimes, I, he says, I always listen. Sometimes I respond. Sometimes I remain quiet. Sometimes I just nod, depending on what the situation is. The Rambam shows us that he's in control of his emotions. He doesn't get mad. He says it all depends on what the circumstances are. Sometimes he just nods and says, yes, thank you, you're right, you know, I'll look into it. He doesn't get into the arguments. He says, this is what I want you to do. This, you have to follow good, to have to have good midot, just like I do. And he says, I am not trying to establish my reputation by defeating fools in arguments. That's what he says. I'm not, I'm not here to argue, to convince you that I'm right. It's not about that. And that's not the point of his endeavor. If you don't believe that this book is for you, then don't read it. And he says, but he, he says, I know that in this generation, people don't understand what I did. But he said, the Rambam says, in future generations, they will know what I did. And Baruch Hashem, we know that later generations, when they study the, the Mishnah Torah, they, there isn't any yeshiva in the world that doesn't look at the Mishnah Torah and learn it inside in order to know not only what the halacha is, but how to understand the Gemara. That is one of the, I think, more important things of the Mishnah Torah is that if you know what sugya the Rambam is talking about, to read the sugya and see what the Rambam, how the Rambam understood the same sugya that you're learning. And then ask yourself, how did the Rambam get this? How did he learn it? And so many times when you read the Gemara, you think, that's not what it is. But then you look at the Rambam and you go, I really missed it. I didn't understand what that word was. Or that you see that the Rambam has entirely a different source where he's learning your, it's so that you think it's the sugyas in Gitin. But the Rambam has a completely different source. It's some medrash that he's or Yerushalmi. And that you thought it was over here. The Rambam should be like this, but the Rambam isn't. He says, and this is, I, I think for me, this, this is the, the clincher. He says, I will not boast that I never made a mistake in my life. I made mistakes. Adraba, whatever comes clearer to me that I saw that what I wrote or what I said was a mistake, I go back and change it. And we have in the manuscript traditions, you see that the Rambam in his own handwriting crossed it out and wrote a new pshat. And he says, the Rambam says, the fact that people use the fact that I changed my mind as evidence against me, doesn't bother me because I am a man of truth. I seek the truth. And if I made a mistake, I'm man enough to admit it. And I go back and I change it. And it means that recalling manuscripts and sending letters out. That is, you have to let everybody know that you were wrong. And the Rambam says, I don't have a problem with any of my writings, even in my midot, if I behave in a way that I did and I realize I made a mistake, I apologize. I fix it. This is the Rambam. This is the Rambam. This is, if you look at his midot, you see from this letter of how he's speaking to a student and describes himself. This is, somebody, this is why his writings are so important to us. Whether it's on ethics, whether it's in philosophy, whether it's in Torah and halacha, this is the Rambam. The end of the letter, the Rambam writes about the death of his daughter. Um, he had a baby daughter that died. And he writes, he says, May Hashem make her death kapara. 
Kapar. And he says, he says to his student, I don't want you to lament. I don't want you to be sad. I don't want you to be sad not on a boy or a girl. Why? Because Hashem Barach knows. And that what he does is good for the species of humanity, for the human species. A very, very important idea. He says, and he writes, it doesn't mean that everything that is happening is absolutely good in itself. That's for sure not. Okay? It's not Shainyan Tov Muchlat, but rather Yoter Naot. Of the options, this is the better option. It's not absolute good, but this, whatever is happening, it means that it, that was the best option in the eyes of the Kaddish Baruch And he says, and worrying about this is not going to help you. He says, the tikkun agadol v'tov me'od ma'ashik azra chuchmat bar'o. He says, the great, the, you want to know how to look at the world? You have to look at the world in the way that the chuchma of Hashem, the wisdom of Hashem runs this world. And then he says, a person needs to look at good in reality in general, not in individuals. So he says, "Imetziut haminin lo ishi ishi yayen v'istakel betov inyani ishi aprat." The way that you judge the goodness of Hashem is not by looking at each individual and watching that particular life and seeing. No, it's by looking at the entire, the total picture. And I think that is also chizuk for us. I mean, we are in a very complicated and difficult times. We've been at war for what, 85, 86 days, plus or minus. It's a very difficult time. A lot of Jews were murdered, soldiers were killed, a lot of families that are became now shkulim, right? They have family members that died in the hands of the terrorists, Shem Yirachem. And we might Ask ourselves, how, what's going on? How is this good? Why is Hashem doing this? The Rambam is telling you, look, yes, you could look at specific events, narrow it, then it becomes very, very difficult to say that everything is good. But you need to have a much wider perspective. The wider perspective is what's important for us to understand that this is better than what it could have been. We have been a people for a long, long time. We've seen lots and lots of historical events. And we have known better days than we have known worse days. And we have to look at the total picture and understand that there's Ashgach Prati, the Kaddish Baruch Hu, has a goal for the Jewish people to bring us closer and closer to true redemption. And that's what the Rambam is telling his student. He says, you have to look at the total picture. And he says, when you will get the chapters of Mar Nevuchim on this topic, you will see the entire description of this. Which means you see in this letter, he says, this, these things are coming piece by piece. I'll end with two short stories about the Rambam, or at least his influence. There's a Sefer called Aliyot Eliyahu, which tells us stories about the Gaon of Vilna. And in, in, in the book, it tells a story that there was a Rav in Vilna, Rav Treitel, I think that was his name. He went to the Gaon of Vilna to complain because he saw two people sitting in a base medrash and learning Moira Nevuchim. And he wanted the Gaon of Vilna to do something about it. We cannot have pe two people sitting and learning more in Nebuchi. And the gown, the story, this is what it is, I'm quoting. He says, Who would dare to speak against Kvod Rambam and his book? And his book, Vesifro. Ve'ashrei mi she'itzneni and may it be that I will be a ye'imo be'michitzaso be'gan Eden. And that I would merit to be with him in Gan Eden. That's the Gaon of Vilna. And the Gaon of Vilna is if you learn your dad, you'll see that he's not always 
happy with the Rambam. He says the Rambam had Greek influence, and that's why he has these ideas. But he, the God of Vilna says, I, I wish that I would in heaven be next to the Rambam and his Sefer, which is Mari Navuchi. The Sefer Chacham Razim tells the story of Repinchas Mikuritz. That uh, Pinchas Mikuritz, one time one of his, somebody came to his son and said, can I borrow a book? And the son wanted to give him Mari Nebuchim. Let him learn. He said, hey, look, my father doesn't really learn Mari Nebuchim too often, so I'll let him. And Repinchas Mikuritz said that the books of the Rambam, when they're in home, Mevi'im li'irat Hashem. That is, they increase Yirat Shamaim. And you cannot give any safer of the Rambam out. It has to stay in the house. Very, very interesting. Just to summarize, we have one more minute. The Rambam is not only known for his writing in the Torah field. He was a very, very accomplished physician. Uh, there were two types of physicians in the, in the, middle, in the middle Ages. There were theoreticians and practitioners. Um, the, the Arabic sources say that the Rambam was, was, a, was a theoretician. But if you look at his medical writings, he has a, I read his book on asthma. I'm not a, an expert. I'm not that type of a physician, a doctor. I'm not a doctor who understands the respiratory system. But the Rambam tells you in this book that altitude affects your ability to breathe asthma, the, the diet, um, the humidity, the weather. He lists all sorts of things. He has a book as on known poisons. Um, he became very, very famous as a physician in Egypt. Um, and being a physician was because of a family tragedy. The family was supported by the Rambam's brother. I think his name was David. That the family gave money to, the, to David uh, ben Maimon. And he was a gem dealer. He would buy precious stones. And uh, there's a letter that the Rambam wrote him and told him to go as far as Sudan to, for the trade. But the, his brother decided to go farther to Yemen and India. And in the Indian Ocean, there, he was on a ship that drowned. And he died with the entire fortune of the family. And that's when the Rambam decided that he needed to earn a living and became a physician. And so if you look at the famous letter from Shmuel ibn Tibon, where he describes his schedule being the physician of the Caliph, Salah Hadin, the person who conquered Jerusalem from the Crusaders, um, he, the Rambam is talking about that's the later period in the Rambam after he wrote the Mishnah Torah. We will uh, end here, and I would encourage you to, if you can, spend some time today learning something that the Rambam wrote. There's plenty in English, certainly in Hebrew, and if you could in Arabic, that would be great. Thank you.